In celebration of Jamaica's 50 years of independence 2013, a group of young people from Bristol work with Ujima Radio and 8 Sense Media to produce this film. It explores the history of Jamaican reggae and culture and its influence in our musical city. Through looking at the past through the eyes of the key Bristol artists and cultural pioneers, we discovered exciting stories about how bass culture, originating from African drum sound, has travelled from Jamaica to Britain and is still the heartbeat of current music trends today. Well, Calypso to start with, matter of fact, and then we go on to Blue Beat. Most of the songs that were made were the slaves between themselves to curse their own captures bass culture, but it's a term that brought together what was happening in the UK that based on Jamaican music, but was essentially a British experience. What we're looking at under the heading bass culture is the impact of those experiences, which were considered alien back then, the impact of that culture, and how over the decades that has become part and parcel of what we call British and what was on the score of multiculturalism. The arrival of the SS Rindros, there was a musician called Lord Kitchener. As he stepped off the boat, he sang, and he said, London's a place for me. And this was picked up by news coverage, and it's become a symbolic, iconic picture. And the song, too, which kind of echoed the sentiments of Caribbeans as they arrived. Y'all I want to go back home, Africa, as a tired road, Africa, y'all I want to come back home, Africa, as a tired road, Africa. When I came to Bristol in 1957, I had to sleep in a doorway in Ashley Road of all places because I know nobody and I was wandering around trying to get somewhere. It was different from what we was taught in Jamaica coming to England. Coming to England was a street, supposed to be the street painted goal. It was way below our standard, because the, the living standard that we had in Jamaica when we come here, we were really down below that standard. Because we left a seven part apartment house in Jamaica when we come here, we live in two bedroom flat. Our parents tell us all kind of things to get us into this country, and when I came to this country, I think my first experience landing at Heathrow Air Airport was all these black smoke coming out of this thing. I've never seen a chimney before because we don't have chimney in Jamaica. It's warm, and the, it's, I think it's you know, the warmest county in, Britain, in the whole England. Brits really get to grips with Jamaican culture. It's round about 1964 with a hit by Millie Small, My Boy Lollipop. And from that point onwards, we start to develop an audience, uh, quite a specialist audience to begin with. So from this tiny island of less than two million people, two and a half million people at the time, the music was competing with the juggernaut, which was American music. A lot of the song my dad sing, most, most of those overseas artists influence, American artists influence Jamaican artists. I mean, what I know, because I used to hear a lot every morning on the radio. When I'm coming up, most of American songs and things well, are the cover of what Jamaicans do to as they're trying to make a name. But I always preferred listening to the black music. It wasn't just three guitars and a drummer. The wonderful horn section, saxophones, trumpets, trombones, and people who sang from below their throats. They didn't shout words. It came from the heart and the soul. Ray Charles was the most fantastic voice I never heard in my life when I first heard him on AFN back in the late 50s. With refused access to local pubs and music venues, they set about creating their own entertainment. In 1966, Bristol saw the infamous Bamboo Club open its doors, followed a few years later by other more underground clubs like Ajax Blues. It's that generation of people if they went into town and were abused, they couldn't hear the music they wanted to listen to anyway. So that was their way of being able to be in among their own community, recreate as far as you can in this climate, what they experienced back in the Caribbean. What was the music they were playing at that time? Everything that you get in reggae, everything. So you have different artists from all over the world. Derek Morgan, Owen Gray, uh, Pat Kelly, even Bob Marley stuff. 
I saw they were not next one in England as a bamboo club. Coming to Bamboo Club and seeing all these black people, white people as well, and the music. It was really, really great. The blues is like a tradition from, from Africa. They call them shubin. African peoples enjoy themselves from midnight onwards. And what we found with um, venues in the UK is that they would close at midnight. And so, you know, we wouldn't have anywhere to go. That whole scene was a scene where it was quite exclusive to the Jamaicans what first came over. Going to a house party or a shubin, being next to this alien community, because that's how Caribbeans were described at the time, and an alien sound, which was the sound system. And it, the sonics of that was a heavy, heavy bottom end. With Jamaican record imports hitting the British streets through the 60s and 70s, UK sound system culture was rapidly growing. A classic ingredient of tracks was toasting, the art of talking and battling over an instrumental track. Clement Coxon's Studio One and Duke Reed's Trojan sound system began producing exclusive mixed recordings in Jamaica. Known as dub plays, these were pressed on acetate to test audience reaction. It's the thing, when you just go listen to sound systems, that's what would get everyone going is when you heard a dub play mix, you know, the mix nobody else had, you know, it was an exclusive mix. You couldn't play a big sound without having a good stack of dub plays. In fact, one of your boxes had to be filled with them because sometimes you'd be playing like five or six hours of pure dub play straight. All one has to do is just voice it, add their own sound effects or add effects or whatever it is going to be to make it into a dub play. In those days, you only have two sounds. You used to have um, um, Count Neville and Tarzan and the High Priest. And then after that, now you get Ajax, you get Commander, you get Stillwater, you get Sebastian. Those are those new sounds coming after all that. But at those days, only two sounds was used to play into the, the shoe beads. Feeling a need to celebrate their Caribbean culture and educate locals, a group of residents started the St. Paul's Festival in 1967, internationally recognized now as St. Paul's Carnival. It was a community thing, actually, it was a community thing, and we all, you know, put our effort into it. Everything we do is togetherness. Yes, and we did the festival for 11 years. No help. No sponsorship, no nothing. We take our caps and hats off and go around to the doors and ask for pennies, eight minutes, profits, six minutes. Anywhere that you find African people, you're going to get some form of what we call mass. And that's the parading of costumes, the playing of music and food and just the general good time because that, that's our culture. It's the one thing that everybody can be part of Carnival yeah, in, in the year. So even if you've just moved into the area, you can still be part of Carnival. You can still get to know, you know people who you may not really, you, you know, you might see them because you live in the area for the rest, the rest of the year, but you actually get to talk to them because you've got this one thing in common. You know, you've got people traveling coming to Bristol for Bristol Park, it's just like amazing, do you know what I mean? The 70s created interest in the Rastafarian religious movement. Bob Marley led the way through his music, putting Jamaica and roots reggae music firmly on an international platform. The area started to turn, most, you know, Rasta was the DM thing, so most people, young people are into that. Rastafarian, you know, has never been accepted amongst, amongst the, um, the mass. Even in Jamaica, it's always been a struggle. I can, as Bob Marley and Peter Touch, Burning Spear, those people, through their music, um, kind of expose it on a wider scale. Count Tuzzi and the Mystic Revelation was the one that tore Europe and Houghton, European eyes onto Rastafari. People say I'm a Rasta artist, like I didn't actually try to be a Rasta artist, I'm just, that's me, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's all to do with me. I'm not Rasta for anybody, basically. I noticed that the things I was writing about um, was 
the kind of themes was the same as the Rasta man. And that's when I first decided to grow uh, locks. At that time, we had uh, mods and we had skinheads. Mods were into American music and black music, essentially. They embraced ska, they embraced the system through which they experienced it, which was sound systems. They embraced the community, which was the Jamaican community at the time. And they start to, started to embrace the fashion that um, was visible by the Jamaican community. Black was formed on 1979. It was a conscious decision to do that, to, to um, been, been to school, go through the system, do the apprenticeship things, and then after five years, you take 200 scrappies at a 18 year old. Factory closed down, no work. So I know what was that all about? You know what I mean? So we sit down and decide, say, no, we have to make people know, say, right now we're hurting. You know what I mean? And that's how Black Coast really come about. With reggae, you know, the, the message, it has to have some form of inspiration and some form of message. Because if otherwise, it's not reggae. Cause, you know what I mean? That's the full package. You know what I mean? And on the job and bass, it has to have something I said to, to enlighten people, or to uplift people, or to ease the pressure of the oppressed. You know what I mean? Or to soften the heart of the oppressors. You know what I mean? That's what it's all about. You have individual artists like Hope and Lewis, um, Burning Spear, the Wheelers, before they become what, uh, Bob Marley, they were the Wheelers, Toots and the Maytales, the Maytones. People see reggae in the UK as London or Birmingham. They've never seen it as Bristol. Bristol's always been this kind of, you know, strange, dark place in the end of the M4 that nobody used to go to in there. We found this. The quality of the work, you know, sits right there. It's like classic British reggae. And, and you know, it's been really well received on a global level. We do, we do have about four sessions for John Peel. John Peel are the one that launched Black Roots, man. John Peel tells everybody, say, if you know, John Peel go on the road and say, if you know, why any good reggae band, and just go to Bristol and listen to Black Roots. Mid 70s, we see a coming together, a recognition amongst youth of the challenge of finding a job, the challenge of trying to fit in, a challenge of identity, and a musical challenge. On one side it's punk, and now it's reggae. And we have punks who've been brought up on a diet of Jamaican music, um, creating their own music, which is anti-establishment. But recognizing as youth, there's a synergy between black and white. We used to do rock against racism. We used to do um, the, 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 the peace, um, Greenpeace campaign. So what I'm telling you, say, and Bristol was the forefront for those kind of things at, at those times. We never had no, no support. Outside of, you know, being playing in venue or uh, produce, pressing a few copies, a couple hundred copies themselves while they were at the venue, you know. The, the pump period and those like helped to, to advertise the music more, where they become more accepted. The Black and White Cafe was another iconic establishment from the era. It provided a home to anyone looking for entertainment or 24-hour refreshment and a central base for the local Caribbean community. Despite this, there was constant tension with authorities. In 1981, a riot broke out over a dispute at the cafe. With high unemployment, Bristol reggae artists like Talisman, Black Roots, Bonnie Marrett, and others reflected the dissatisfaction of young people through their topical lyrics. Right about those time they had what they call the, the sus laws. A police could stop you at any time, any time of the day or night, search you as long as they were, they had a suspicion that you were up to no good. The first single uh, Dole H came out on Recreational Record. It talked about the political situation at the time. There was a large group of people that were suffering under the Margaret Thatcher government. Um, three and a half million people. I don't think it's ever been um, it's ever been reached again. There was a rap at the end of that song about Margaret Thatcher. It was deemed to be 
slander. People just didn't want to touch it, although it got played on some of the more radical the radio stations. The thing with the black and white was probably that it dealt with it, it dealt with the issue at the time of you know people not feeling part or not feeling able to go anywhere else. It was very hard for young black men on the streets. Going into the city centre was difficult for a black person in them times as well. It was a real experience. It was uh, the police were basically outnumbered and had to sort of pull back as well. So lots of breaking um, shop windows, lots of looting going on, fire. Only on certain streets you could even get get a room to rent. Like if you go a certain place in early as 1980 you got a certain place in Bristol after 9 o'clock at night, you guarantee as a black youth was going to get arrested. You know what I mean? So tribalism was still around, you know what I mean? Jubilee and Lincoln, we asked him if, if, if there were something to do at the time. Have a, like say, a, 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 a workshop or a youth club, or you have, some, you have a library, or somewhere the youth them can sit down and pass things to one another. You know what I mean? Communicate, find something to do or whatever. Because sometimes prevention is better than cure. By the beginning of the 1980s, technology was influencing Bristol's sound system culture and a new underground club and art scene was emerging. Competing crews, Wild Bunch, Too Bad Crew, City Rockers and UD4 rub shoulders with graffiti artists Inky and Banksy. Grant Marshall honed his DJ skills as part of the Wild Bunch at the Dugout Club, a notorious 80s melting pot playing punk, jazz and reggae music. For us, the club which was the club for us in my era um, was a club called the Dugout Club which sprung that whole Bristol vibe. But the thing that really kind of um, made me want to get into the whole DJ culture was a film called Wildstar. Um, when I saw that it was kind of like an instant attraction. Um, I saw these guys who had come from a similar background as myself that, you know, were, were scratching and rapping and, you know, breakdancing and stuff. And I immediately was like, yeah, I want to do that. In the 70s, reggae, you know, production of reggae beat anything on the planet. Everything else it was all made range and light stuff. The only place you could do it was full on bass, was, was reggae. And the productions as well, you know, loads of effects, free of them, on, on drums and snares and stuff. Nobody else wasn't really doing that. They put a little kind of light. It was light. So if you want to hear hard music, it was reggae. You know, trying to uh, create something that people would have to come to us for specifically. And so what we set out to do is create a certain type of music with uh, the idea about what we, what we were about in Bristol. Wow. Wow. Bristol was leading the UK's underground music scene with the emergence of reggae-influenced 90s music genres, jungle, drum and bass, and trip-hop, loosely described as heavy bass hip-hop without the rap. Massive Attack evolved from the Wild Bunch sound system and spellbound the club scene with their UK hit single, Unfinished Sympathy. Reggae music influenced, they call it trip-hop, but that's like an ugly name, really. It was just sound system music, it was sound system music that had a heavy bass. Slowly, throughout the early 90s, the uh, house music was speeded up a bit and then they intro introduced break beats. And the music got faster and faster. And that, along with dub music, the dub reggae bass lines, slowly turned into what we now call jungle drum and bass music. Jungle and being a junglist was quite an important mission and it was quite militant and it was very important to be on that dance floor for as long as you could to create energy with other people and the role that the DJ and the music and the MC played in that was integral. A producer in Jamaica named King Pubbies that, that's the originator of the dub. They talk about dubstep, drum and bass and all of them things there. You trace it back right to King Tobis. Because if you hear the tick 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 the web, King Tobis are doing things and you hear that kind of vibes there. Eh? It's just like drum and bass, the only thing the drums are speeding, the drums just go up a, a tempo faster. 
Bristol's first black pirate radio station, BAD, started in 1987, closely followed by many others playing black music, not being aired on mainstream stations. We were broadcasting um, without a license, but we consider ourselves pioneers because of what we were doing on air. The pirate stations, or like we like to call them, the protest stations, made it their point of duty to do everything the opposite of what the local ILR stations were actually doing. I was part of a sound system, and many of the DJs that were on the radio station, or certainly on FTP, were from came from sound systems and um, what they did, they just brought a completely new music genre to the airwaves uh, and people liked it. So in terms of um, making uh, music popular, like reggae music more popular, the Pirates had a great hand in doing that. In fact, they had a great hand in even developing music as well because when drum and bass came on, came, uh, came on stream or came on the line, it was just seen as a couple of guys in their bedrooms mixing down music, using different speeds, different drum beats and all sorts. Well, those experiments that were happening in the bedroom eventually got onto the radio stations and through the popularity of the radio stations, the music genre itself became hugely popular. By the mid-90s, youth culture was awash with a riff of new genres. From the darker side of Garage and the two-step in the 90s and the DIY grand beat and MCs of the early 2000s. Again, Bristol was at the forefront with artists like Applebaum, Pinch and more recently Joker. It was Rinse FM that really started broadcasting the sound. I think it was Mixmag that actually coined the phrase dubstep. If you look at the drum and bass sort of scene of Ronnie Size and Full Cycle. Um, and yeah, I think dubstep kind of followed on from that. Dubstep for me, I think it was probably a tune by this uh, by Lofa, who's really well known, but this tune called Horror Show, which kind of, well, the name says it all, it's, it's like a beast of a tune. I remember being down the Black Swan in Bristol, like, uh, gosh, it must have been like 2004 or five. This tune comes on, the sound system is insane, and everyone, like, we were so much pain because of the bass and the vibrations, it was overwhelming. The grime and spitting and grime, you know what I mean? And when, like, dubstep was kind of coming out it was just coming through certain grimy beats in grime so that's the reason why it even kind of happened where man is making that kind of sound and i think that whole ethos of you can do it yourself you know um from the punk scene you know from the reggae scene it's the same like dubstep and jungle drum and bass you know it's kids now at home making their own music realizing that they can do it not needing, not needing the backup of big major record companies, and you can do it yourself. So you can play dubstep, you can play hip hop, you can play dancehall, you can play roots music, you can play lovers rock, you can play rare groove. It's all sound system music. And this is what we represent. Even the title, dub step, within certain communities, has no relationship to its origins. So what we're saying in bass culture is that. We totally recognise reggae as being a key influence in the UK and perhaps the trunk of black music in the UK. It's absolutely critical that we, as um, a society, a community, credit that past. And in cities like Bristol, Birmingham, uh, London, that community is owed a debt that can only be paid through heritage. Watch out, peace out, dub man. <laughs>